Peter. We're going to look at one other scripture first, but first scripture we're going to look at is Revelation 12:10. I'd like to read an introductory statement here before we read that scripture. We know our our enemies. For example, if a spirit of fear comes at you and you're a pretty mature Christian, you kind of feel the pain of that fear and you know to resist it. You recognize it, you speak to it. Are you following? We know how to resist the enemy. But tonight, I want to talk to you about an enemy that is so pervasive it is sometimes hard even to identify it, let alone resist it, and that is a critical spirit. And I'm not saying at all that we as a congregation have a problem with this, but it's so pervasive in our society. Once in a while, I find myself looking at the dark side of everything. Or Have you ever had that happen? Okay. So I, I thought we would look at what the Bible says about it. Revelation 12.10 John says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. Now what is Satan <coughs> called in this verse? The accuser. the accuser of the brethren. He is the finger pointer and the tongue wagger. Okay? <laughs> In which part of the day and night does he accuse the brethren? All day and all night, okay? And you've heard that voice speaking in your head, but he not only accuses you to you, he accuses you to God, he accuses God to you the way he did to Eve. God knows you, you know, you'll be like him. And he accuses us to each other. The spirit that pervades this age is not a spirit of acceptance and approval, but a spirit of disdain, arrogance and caustic criticism. Now I'm not saying everywhere, you'll hear a word of affirmation sometimes, but overall it seems like that spirit pervades our social media, we know that, talk shows, kindergarten playgrounds at times, sororities and fraternities, and it will even pervade churches if we allow it, okay? So I'm just trying to try to help us take a strong stand against it, um, accusers have always been around. David asked for deliverance from his accusers. And just between you and me, I got convicted. I don't consider myself a real negative person, a real critical person. Sometimes I offer advice when it's not wanted, and that comes across as criticism. Do you see what I'm saying? I was convicted studying this today. I'm going to look at this scripture, if we could, in Psalm 109, 3 to 4. David said this, they have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. In return for my love, they act as my accusers, but I am in prayer. Now, I think we've all probably experienced a time when we thought we were just on really good terms with somebody and that we'd done everything right, and then we found out they were mad at us and talking behind our backs. And that hurts, okay? So he's, David had a problem with accusers. Now, the tricky part of this not only must we forgive the accusers of false accusations, you have to resist that spirit, or if you're not careful, it starts getting on you. To where, you know, you, you're as critical of them as, you are, as they are of you. And you may ask, why is our being free of a critical spirit so important? Now listen to this carefully. Because our posture of pride or humility before God determines how much of the favor and help of God we can receive. I'm going to say that again. Every one of us <clears throat> has a pride of posture, or a, excuse me, every one of us has a posture of humility or pride before God. And that can vary day to day. Okay, it's not like, it would be wonderful tomorrow morning we could all adopt humility and that would be the end of the war with pride. You say, Pastor, are you saying I have a war with pride? I'm saying if you're a human being on the planet, you have a war with pride. Pride was Lucifer's first sin. It was the sin that said, I will exalt my throne above the throne of God. And so we all, so the reason, if you would give in to a critical spirit, the critical spirit always says this, I would never do that. Um, You've heard that thought, I've heard that thought. But that's the spirit of pride. Because that but for the grace of God, you and I could do just about anything. Yeah. <laughs> so, the reason that we, okay, this, I know it's going to be fun. 
but it actually kind of helped me. Because none of us wants to live angry. You know what I mean? And the thing is, you never wake, you never wake up. You never say, okay, today I'm going to be angry. And then all of a sudden you think, oh, you get your heart, your heart gets harder and harder. And so we want to go to 1 Peter 5 <clears throat> and look about what you do. When some, when, have you ever just been kind of overwhelmed with, it, with thoughts like, well, how could they? How, how, how could they? Honestly, really, honestly, really. Okay, you've all heard that, right? How are we going to overcome it? <clears throat> Excuse me, 1 Peter 5, 5. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Why? For God is opposed to the crowd that gives grace to the humble. Now the truth is, if words mean anything, if we want to receive grace day by day, we've got to keep a posture of humility toward God and toward people. I'm not better than somebody else. I may have a mature day, and then I may have an immature day. <clears throat> okay, let me smile, or you know what I'm saying? Okay, here we go. When you and I adopt a critical spirit, we're actually embracing arrogance and resisting the grace of God. And the, here's the problem. I wish I could have found it. I used to have a prop. I took black construction paper and made a huge magnifying glass. I used cellophane for the glass. And I went around looking at everybody. I mean, that's what the devil does for you. He makes this huge magnifying glass. Right. And then especially the people you live with, he puts it on them and says, doesn't that just drive you nuts? Didn't they say that three times in a row? Really? It's just, okay. When you hear those thoughts, okay, if fear came at your heart and you felt a pain of fear, most of us would know, fear, I resist you in Jesus' name. Well, let me tell you a trick. When you hear that, and the, the pointing of the finger and the wagging of the tongue, you, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, you need to say right out loud, excuse me, spirit of pride, and you critical demon, I will not be your prey. You will not have my heart. You need to resist it. Anything. Oh, this is fun. But I'm telling you, it's what does it say? God is opposed to the crowd, but He gives grace to the humble. You might say it's not fun to humble yourself. It's better than not having grace. Uh, yeah. Amen. <laughs> well, you all can make it a little easier. Verse eight. <laughs> Look what Peter says. Be a sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, you see, I've read that spirit for earth for a long time, and I think, well, you know, that means sickness, or that means lack, or that means poverty, or whatever that is, that devouring spirit. But it, a critical spirit, if it can get a hold of a life, completely, completely thwarts joy in that life. There's no, if you know a critical person, think of them. Pretty soon it shows up on their face. Their, their mouth is turned down and they're bitter. Because all they can see is the evil everywhere. Okay? If you... Okay, praise the Lord. I'm not saying you have this problem. I'm glad you don't. Here we go. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is when you start thinking the worst of more than one person... I mean, I've done this. Recently, I got a rock. And it's just like, nobody could do anything right in my sight. And I'm like, that's not me and that's certainly not the Holy Spirit. And what you do, now listen, you talk to that demon. Yeah. You say, you foul spirit, you critical. And you say, why would you talk to a demon? How do you get rid of fear? You talk to it. Yeah. You talk to it. You take dominion over it. When you see yourself getting grumpier and grumpier and grumpier, you say, you know what, critical spirit, I'm not going to see the worst in everybody. I'm not going to see the worst in my spouse or my kids. Uh, God, Jesus, you see, it says in Romans 15, therefore accept one another the glory of God. The Holy Spirit is the exact opposite of a critical spirit. A critical spirit says, boom, 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 and a Holy Spirit says, wherefore accept one another. I don't know how Jesus, I've got to put my finger up, don't do that. I don't know how the Lord accepted you, but I'll tell you how he accepted me, no strings attached. I was 19 years old when I came back to him and got filled with the Holy Spirit. I could not believe no strings attached. Okay? That's the way we're supposed to love each other. So verse 8, it says, resist the devil. Or verse 9 says, resist and firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. 
I was thinking today, I can't really tell you the biggest difference between heaven and earth because I haven't been to heaven yet. But I personally believe, and listen to this, I personally believe the single greatest difference between the atmosphere of heaven and the atmosphere of earth is the absolute lack of criticism in the air. The wonderful, refreshing atmosphere of being right with God and, and that righteousness of God just, you know, if you ask me as opinion, this is my opinion, why are there not more mighty Christians on the earth? I believe it's one reason. Because we won't let each other be righteous. <clears throat> that be safe. Okay, I know I'm being hard on you. But you know what I'm saying? We, we see little faults. And I'm just telling you, most of the stuff that we find fault with doesn't amount to a hill of beans. <clears throat> Something happened this week and thought, or somebody thought I was going to be really upset with them. And I said, are you alive? This is my kid, one of my kids this time. Usually one of my kids. They, they were away from here and they said, are you, are you alive? Yeah. I said, as long as you're alive and you're going to be okay, I'm happy. And you say, how did you ever come to that point? Well, after I lost my husband, everything in the world started, and you say, I shouldn't refer to it. Well, that, was a, that was an epiphany to me. There are very few really big things. We make a huge deal out of stuff that's not a huge deal. Yeah, yeah. There's a few huge deals in life. And the number one huge deal is that you love people, that you're accepting the people. You let the people around you be righteous. I'm going to give you scripture for it. God, when he looks at you, does not see every stupid little mini sin by mini sin. You, you say something that comes out wrong. And some people want to jump on you for it, okay? Man, I wouldn't wish to be the pastor of anybody. Oh. I'll, I'll tell you why. I'm not even tell you why. It's because everybody's good to me, but I, don't, I have to be really careful what I say. Because if I just say something normal, it's like a sledgehammer behind it. So if I mess up once in six months, I'm going to know about that time I mess up. Because, do you understand? Just because, yeah. And what I'm trying to say tonight is, you need a lot of slack. I personally need a lot of slack, at least some slack. <laughs> and the truth is that in heaven, Nobody's jumping down to anybody's throat. Hallelujah. They're not seeing. Okay, this hallelujah. I truly believe the single the biggest difference will be the fact that nobody's on anybody's case. And you say, well, why, why is this such a big deal? Because if you if you even watch the news, just this yeah. tension of you feel like that's the way it is. It's not the way it is in the kingdom. Matthew seven one. We're going to wrap this up, King. In there, you can make it fifteen minutes, then we'll have Thanksgiving reports or something. Hallelujah. Something happy. Now, Jesus said, do not judge that you will not be judged. Let's take one second. Many people have quoted that verse out of context to justify a sinful lifestyle. Yeah. We do not judge people. That's not our job. They will, they will stand before the judge of all the earth. But we judge sin. And you say, why do I... Okay, let me explain. To say, fornication is fine is a lie. Yeah. God judges fornication. Yeah. It's not my, judge, my job to judge the fornicator, but if I stand up here and say, well, I just don't want to judge, and I just think all gays and all trisexuals, how many sexuals do they have now? All of them go to heaven. Okay? That's just fine until the day if they get drug off to hell, they, I have their blood on my hands. Do you understand? So I'm not anybody's judge, but I am the judge of sin according to the word of God. The word of God speaks against sin. Lying is a sin. Okay. So, we don't... You're not ju my judge and I'm not your judge. But we do hold sin up as sin or we can't help the world. Does he, do you understand that? Okay. Next verse. In the way... When he said don't judge, that means don't jump down everybody's throat all the time. That's not our job. In the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. <clears throat> is, and that, is there another verse there? Four and five. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Um... If you hold everybody in your home to a standard of perfection, 
and I might be guilty of that, you better be perfect yourself. And we just aren't. We've got to have mercy. But Jesus, when he said, oh, come here, I think I see a splinter in your eye. I used to have a very big magnifying glass. And it's sort of like, bring me the tweezers and the blowtorch, and we'll get rid of that splinter, you know? <laughs> we, okay, yeah. so this isn't fun. All I'm trying to say is, in the, in the kingdom of God, mercy triumphs over judgment. It's what it says in the book of James. Yes. And if we were more merciful, it, it says in the book of Proverbs, the merciful man does go to his own soul, literally. Yeah. The merciful man does go to his own soul. Truth is, you don't have enough information to judge everybody else. No. I don't know what your day was like. You don't know what my, you know what I'm saying? All right, it'll be over in a minute. Romans 15, 5 to 7. What is, Romans 15, verse 5, Paul says, Now the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, mm -hmm. accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. You know, like I said, he didn't say, I accept you after you change these five things. You know, he's, he just goes like this, and then when you're ready, he puts you on the potter's wheel, and as gently as possible, he starts working on you. But, okay, hallelujah. Yes. Everybody say this, the spirit of the Holy One is the spirit of acceptance. The spirit of acceptance. Then say the spirit of the devil is the spirit of accusation. Hallelujah. Yep. I already said this, I'll say it one more time. I do think it would be very hard to have a miracle working ministry and not have a concept of your righteousness. And to have a concept of your righteousness, you've got to be around people that don't pick at you all the time. Just a thought. Hallelujah. Yeah. Jesus paid the price according to 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. Remember how Al pre preached on 2 Corinthians 5, 20 that we were reconnected? Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of God, be reconnected to God. That's what that word reconcile means. Because he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I'm going to show you a scripture in a minute that says those who are being sanctified, he are perfect in his sight. Mm -hmm. I believe that as long as you are letting God work on you, in his sight, he counts it as you as perfect. We will say, where is that? Oh, yeah. It's in Hebrews 10, the very next scripture. Then we're going to see, how many people do you see as the righteousness of God? I, I know I'm challenging you, but I honestly believe that this this is something that has destroyed churches. I'm not saying it's big in our church. I think we've done really good. Hallelujah. But how many people... One time the Copelands were having a, a discussion. And it got a little bit heated. And Gloria went to Kenneth and she said, I find no fault in you. Mm. That's what Pilate said of Jesus. Can you look at your spouse and say, I find no fault in you? No. That's... Now watch this. You see, I, you know, you can say this is a negative message, but I don't see it as negative. No. No. This is a me this is a message about righteousness yeah. in the sight of God. Now watch these verses and see if you can believe them. The author of Hebrews, I believe it was Paul, said this: By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never be taken away sins. Read this with me. But he, having offered one sacrifice for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Two more verses. Read, read it with me. Waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. Now, Read it with me. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. If you look in the Greek, that sanctified is a, is a continual process. Those who are in the process of being sanctified. How many of you are in the process of being sanctified? You're not there yet, but you say, God, work on me. Okay. If you're in the process of 
of being sanctified, the Lord sees you as perfect. He has perfected for all time. And you say, what does the difference mean? I just believe that the more we find fault with each other, the less aware of our right standing. Can you imagine having a day where you never felt guilty about anything? <laughs> where nobody made you feel, you can't even imagine that, can you? And yet that's the, that is the kingdom he's called us to. Hallelujah. Yeah. If we want the Father's favor, we must agree with his assessment of our brothers and sisters, our lives, and he who began a good work, this has got to be my attitude toward you. The one who began a good work in you is actively, faithfully fulfilling it. He who began a good work in you will perfect until the day of Christ Jesus. Uh, and that means I don't have to criticize or give too much advice. I'm learning. Okay. I don't believe you will ever know your own righteousness from God and be, reap the benefits of that righteousness until you allow the people around you to be righteous. And do you know why that is? No, we don't think of it this way, but when Satan puts out an accusation, he's calling for judgment. He's calling for a curse. Okay? Yeah. Now, we don't mean it that way, but a critical spirit calls for curses on people's lives. I'm going to show it to you in the scripture. Look at Psalm 109, 17 and 18. He also loved cursing, so it came to him. He did not delight in blessing, so it was far from him. He clothed himself with cursing as with a garment. It entered his body like water and oil into his bones. Cursing, in Spanish, maldecir is to curse. But really what it means is maldecir is to talk bad about. Mal is bad and decir is to say. It's to say something bad about someone. And yet it is their word for curse. And, and I know this, this is kind of lifting us all up that I don't want to curse our politicians. I think sometimes they're a mess, but you know what? I'm not in the middle of all that with that pressure. We need to be blessing them and asking for help for them. Yeah. And especially our kids. I was raised, I love my mom and dad. My mom and dad were good to me. They were good to me. They made me good. And I still was raised with a critical spirit. I'm just telling you, I had great parents. Took me to Europe twice. Paid for my college education. Those are good parents. They were good to me. Yeah. But boy, you better be A or A plus and no A minuses. <laughs> and after a while, your, your confidence is really shaken. Because you can't always walk that tightrope. <coughs> As a child, sometimes you, I don't ever wanted my kids to be under that tightrope, you know? I'm not sure how good I've done, but I'm, we, we need to put it, get each other off the tightrope right. and, and, and let each other know, hallelujah. When, how do we treat each other if we're not criticizing them? I was thinking the perfect answer is John 13. When Jesus washed their feet, he was what, what did you step in? Couldn't you have stepped over that mess? <laughs> now we laugh. Yeah. But let me tell you something. The day Zacchaeus got saved, I was like, I'm just trying to explain this what I'm seeing in the spirit. The day that Zacchaeus got saved, a lot of us would be saying, how can you have lunch with that little man? He twisted money out of my great aunt Susie when she was on her deathbed. He is a wicked, wicked, wicked man. And you know what? Every bit of that might have been true. Zacchaeus was a wicked man. But you know what Jesus said? Today salvation has come. Because this too is the son of Abraham. He saw the possibility of change. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? He has such a large heart. Yeah. And here's the deal. We love his large heart. His mercy. Somebody said something they shouldn't have said. Like, I probably didn't mean it. Didn't think about it. We'll let it go. Love covers a multitude of sins. Did you know that? First, first Peter says love covers sins. Yeah. And so back to this. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and then he'd come forth from God and was going back to God. Got up from supper, laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he burned it himself. And then he began to pour water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now, pause for just a minute. Do you remember that scripture? I've never thought of it like this before, but the scripture in Romans chapter 8 where it says, the mindset of the flesh is death, the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. 
Yeah. Everything I've had, Jesus had his mindset on the spirit. He loved these people so much. But if you're going to have a mindset on the flesh, you have to understand they shared dirty, dusty roads with all kinds of animals, and you couldn't always step over everything. You were stepping in some stuff. <laughs> now, you know, he could have been down there saying, Father, this is like the crummiest job in the world. What did they get into? Matthew, where did you step? And you say, oh, we wouldn't have said that. I think that's kind of how, do you understand? We're aware. I don't think he's aware. I don't think my imperfections drive him as crazy as they drive my kids. And I drive my kids crazy sometimes. I do. And I don't even mean to. It isn't like I get up in the morning saying, let me drive my kids crazy. I'm just a little intense sometimes. The thing about Jesus is he loves you so much that unless it's actually sin that he has to deal with and get out of your life, I just think we sometimes we're just rough on each other. Oh. Especially our spouses. And you say, oh, it's easy for you to say you're not married. That's true. But I've been married. And I know that it's easier to give your spouse a hard time than anybody on earth. Yeah. Look at verses 13 to 15 in that same chapter. After he, he says, you call me teacher and Lord. And you are right for so I am. If I then, your teacher and Lord, I can't quite do it. You got the next verse. If I then, your teacher and Lord, I have to look it up. As it's stuck. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, I never, for I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. I never looked at it like this before, but. A foot, has anybody ever participated in a foot washing service? It's one of the most humbling things in the whole world. It really is. Have somebody. My grandma, when I was a little kid, five years old, they, they had an old line holiness church and they'd have foot washings. And the day of the foot washing, she spent the entire day giving herself a pedicure. Those were the, and I said, why are they going to wash your feet now? <laughs> I figured that out. And she said, well, I don't want to go to heaven and wash my smelly feet. And, but you know what? When there's something about washing somebody's feet. Because you don't get to pick or choose what's on those feet. You just, and back then especially, this was a true service. And this is the first, let me explain what I was seeing. I was seeing that sometimes one of the ways we wash people's feet is just to love them and let them be righteous and not worry about dumb look. You know, I'm sure you have no places you need to change, but I do, I'm learning. One of my places, I, I want to give everybody advice. If I'm your past. Guess what? Hardly anybody wants my advice. I'm finally figuring it out. So I'm learning to keep my mouth shut unless somebody asks. Okay? Hallelujah. Jesus honestly in his own heart didn't criticize their dirty feet. And I think sometimes the way we wash each other's feet, mm. just to love people, and something happens that wasn't perfect, you just play let it go. You know, not worth it. Most uh, things aren't worth messing with, okay? Amen. First Peter 4 a Peter said, real love, genuine agape, fervent love, covers a multitude of sins. You ever notice when you're really crazy in love, you can't even see the other's faults, and you're trying to tell this person who's in love that you got some real stuff to deal with here, and they can't see it. They're in love. As long as it lasts, you can't see their, you better pray it lasts, man. Okay, but isn't this fun? Now, did you know that if we adopt this, we will be much more relaxed people. Amen. You ever been around a critical person? They're mad at the whole world before the sun ever comes up. They see the worst in everything and say it, and their blood pressure is off the You know? Because you got it. I, I'm the judge of the earth. They've got to get this right. After a while, you say, hey, you know what? You're not. This is their gods. Go to Romans 14. They were having this huge to do. You probably know the story, but you, they were having this enormous. This is our last scripture. This enormous thing about whether it was okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Now the truth is, it's a hunk of meat. And the truth was, they could get meat cheaper than the sacrificed to idols than not because they have sacrificed it. Okay. And Paul says it's a hunk of meat. I almost brought a hunk of meat in here to show you it's just a hunk of stupid thing offered to some. Okay. 
And Paul said, look, if you're mature enough, you can eat the stupid meat. It's nothing. But the trouble is, if it offends your brother who's not in that place and you offend him, then you better become a vegetarian. That's what we're, this, this is true. This is how far we're supposed to go to help each other. Watch Romans 14, 1. Now accept one another, excuse me, accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Whoa. I heard one of somebody say 35 years ago, we started in the church, spiritual pride is the ugliest pride in the world. And I will go on record as saying spiritual pride is the ugliest pride in the world. I am so much more spiritual than if ugly, okay? Don't pass judgment on his opinions. That's not your purpose. One person has faith that he can eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables all only. Now, what does that mean? That means that I can look at that chef roast. I don't care if it was before Diana or what. Diana doesn't even exist. I could care less. I like meat. We're going to have some meat, and I worship Jesus. I got it straight. But then you've got a weaker Christian that says, oh, my. Well, my conscience would be, you respect their conscience. That's where their faith is. You respect it. You don't put it down. You don't judge it. One person has faith in meat all things. The other one who's weak eats vegetables only. Keep going. The one who eats is not, everybody say not, no. to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. Nothing in this church could ever be uglier than somebody looking down on somebody else because they're more spiritual than them. You know? The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats. It's just as wrong for me to say, well, what's wrong with your faith? It's just a hunk of meat. That's wrong. But it's also wrong for the person who's not eating to say, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you know why? Because you're not my judge. And you're, it's, we're going to see in a minute to, your, to his own master who stands or falls. You are not called to be anybody's judge. Yeah. It's okay to say sin is sin. Right. Lying is sin. Murder is sin. That's okay. Right. But you're not anybody's judge. Next verse, please. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. There's nobody in this church that I'm supposed to be judging. I'm not your judge. One person regards one day above another, and another regards every day of life. Each person must be um, fully convinced in his own mind. Can we go back to verse 4? I was an RA when I was in college. The last two years, and we had a great floor of girls, really studied, not a party floor, you know, and I was blessed. But well, one year, everybody got on everybody's case, and my daughter, I mean, how do you study when everybody's, okay? I said, Lord, what do I do? And, and I didn't fully understand the power of the Word of God, then I hadn't been exposed to the Copeland's history, but God gave me that verse. And I put it all, I mean, this is a Christian school, nobody could tell me blah, 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 right? Come on. I like Christian school. <laughs> Anyhow, on the door, in letters this big, it says, who are you to judge the servant of another to his own master? He stands or fall. He will stand. The Lord is able to make him stand. I put that there. And you know, in two days, it was all stopped. Every day, they couldn't go to the dining commons without going out that door. And there's something about the Word of God. Yep. If you got a critical spirit, and I'm not saying I've never dealt with it, so I'm not okay. But you just put that up there and say, you know what, this person that I look down on, I'm actually not their judge. He will stand before Jesus or fall before Jesus, but it's not before me. Okay? We've got two more verses and we're done. We want to read verse 13 and 20 in the same chapter, same subject. Verse 13. Read it out loud. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this. Not to put an obstacle or stumbling block in a brother's way. You say, what could that obstacle or stumbling block? Criticism can actually be a stumbling block to keep people from coming to the Lord. And I don't, honestly, I don't think our church has a big problem with this. But the reason you don't have problems is because you teach on them once in a while and keep your head straight, okay? Yep. Coming, uh, uh, criticism can keep people from serving God, okay? And having joy in it. So we don't want to put that obstacle. Last verse, and read it with me again. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. 
So, you know, there is room in the body of Christ for people to make different decisions on certain things, you know? I don't tell you what music to listen to, the Holy Spirit does. And I, I don't know if you got anything out of that, but it sure did help me because I was getting grumpy and didn't know why. And I thought, you know, why I'm criticizing everybody? So I've repented and hope it up you. Um, Randy, do you want to leave us in prayer tonight?